a lot of prep companies have this tendency to overcomplicate the LSAT with trademarked buzzwords and over categorizations of all the different question types. In reality, I think it doesn't need to be that complicated. You don't need to work through three different 500 page LSAT phone books to understand the LSAT. It can be a lot simpler than that. Take logical reasoning, for example. I would put questions in two different buckets, questions where the answer choices give you new information and questions where the answer choices don't give you new information. First, for those who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I've been teaching the LSAT since 2005, and I increased my LSAT score from a 152 to a 175 on LSAT test day. And logical reasoning really threw me for a loop at first because I was trying to work through those LSAT textbooks. I was trying to understand 15 different approaches for the 15 different question types. And I later came to realize it doesn't need to be that complicated. The LSAT can, in fact, be easy. And instead of categorizing questions by their question stem type, what if we just slow down and took the time to understand the method of reasoning in the stimulus? What if we came to see the LSAT from the test maker's point of view? And I say this because if you don't understand the stimulus, meaning that short bite-sized paragraph, the argument, you don't know anything. And so I came to understand that before getting into strengthen versus weaken versus necessary assumption versus sufficient assumption, what if I were to instead just slow down and say, do I actually understand what the argument is saying? Do I understand a correlation causation argument? Do I understand an argument where they're confusing necessary conditions versus sufficient conditions? If I understand the argument, the question becomes easy. And I could easily imagine a world where the people who make the LSAT have an assembly line approach where one person writes the argument, one person writes the question stem, and one person writes the answer choices. I can't tell you this is exactly how they do this because LSAT questions actually go through several stages of editing and revision to make them airtight with no flaws or gaps of any kind. But I could easily see how the method of reasoning is a different layer than, say, the topic of the question, whether it is dinosaur extinction or speed limits or climate change or heart disease, because the topic never really matters. If you're bad at science questions or think you are, it's because you're actually not understanding the underlying method of reasoning. Because if you did, you'd be able to strip away the topic and actually get at the core logic underlying the argument. When we look at the tricks and traps LSAC uses to ramp up the difficulty level of a question, that typically has nothing to do with whether it is a strengthened question or a weakened question. Instead, it is about how LSAC ramps up the difficulty level of the stimulus first and foremost. Meaning, LSAC is neglecting to include key indicator words for necessary and sufficient conditions, or neglecting to include indicator words for evidence and conclusion, or they are burying the conclusion in the middle of the argument, or they are incorporating a sub-conclusion, or they are incorporating counter-premises, or just plain filler. And so if you figure out what led you astray regarding an argument, what made it difficult for you to dissect and find out this is the evidence, this is the conclusion, and here's the gap between the two. If you can understand that, then you will know what to work on for next time and you will know where to shore up any gaps in your conceptual understanding of arguments as a whole. And yes, of course, there are cases where LSAC makes a really tempting sufficient assumption answer choice for what is actually a necessary assumption question. So if you choose that, you are choosing the right answer to the wrong question and that is why you are getting it wrong. In some cases, yes. But in the vast majority of cases, students are getting questions wrong because they don't actually know what the argument itself is saying. And so in my courses at Allison Unplugged, we walk students through a process called the Socratic Review Method, where we help you figure out what you're getting wrong in your understanding or misunderstanding of an argument so that you can avoid making the same mistakes again. Of course, I've mentioned this in countless videos here on YouTube and elsewhere. If you'd like my help in personally walking you through that process, I'd be glad to help you out. You can check out the links below this video to find out more and to book a call with me and my team. We'd be glad to help you out. Now, the thing is, of course, that engaging in a review process like this to figure out which tricks and traps you're falling for, what mistakes you're making and why, engaging in this kind of process means you're not going to have as much time to do full-length timed practice tests. But that isn't necessarily a bad thing because LSAC has reduced the number of practice tests available inside LawHub. There used to be nearly 100 released LSAT practice tests with the old numbering system back when logic games were on the test. Now with the new numbering system, there are only approximately 60 exams in the new format, and you'll get through them faster 
than you might think. If you were doing, say, three exams a week, it would take you 20 weeks, which is roughly five months. But the thing is, you've probably already worked through bits and pieces of these exams already in doing your foundational phases of your prep. A lot of students, of course, are rightly so doing individual questions by type or they're building their foundation by doing random practice questions here and there. And that means that, unfortunately, some of those 60 exams are already used up. You've already seen some of the materials, so you've spoiled yourself in a sense, meaning that you can no longer take those practice tests as full-length timed exams to evaluate your score out of 180. But in reality, that's okay because you don't need to take 60 full-length time practice tests in a, a timed strict setting. You could instead do maybe 20 exams timed, do the others piecemeal here and there, and you would end up being totally fine. In fact, if you understood 10 exams worth of material inside out thoroughly, you could get a perfect 180 in all of those 10 exams, you would be ready for whatever LSAC would throw your way. But the sad truth is that far too many students only engage in a surface level review of their mistakes. It's far too easy to look at the answer key and say, oh, I get it now. How could I have been so dumb? And they move on to the next thing when instead they should be slowing down and dissecting every single element of the stimulus, the question stem, the choices, tempting wrong answers, unappealing right answers. And until you have determined what mistakes you're making and why, of course, you are likely to make those same mistakes again at Elson Unplugged. That's what we want to help you avoid. Links below if you'd like to find out more. And in the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.